Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Flex EMS Supplement Cohort meeting. We'll have one more of these, but that isn't scheduled yet. So uh, we'll we'll work on that and let you know when that's going to be. Um, Talia, did you have any announcements that you wanted to share with the group before we go ahead and get started with our speaker? No, actually, I don't think I really have anything because I've been meeting with everybody um, this month. So I think we're all good. Thanks, up. All right. Sounds good. So the topic of this call is um, quality improvement from the ambulance services perspective. So that's a little bit different than us talking about our data reporting projects and the, the work that you're doing. This is actually from an ambulance services perspective and kind of how um, how that experience has gone for one specific ambulance service. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it ov over to our speaker, Floyd. Um, if you could just introduce yourself a little bit, um, what your title is, what kind of what your background is, and then go ahead and, and talk to us about what's going on in your organization. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Floyd Miracle. I am an assistant chief for Jessamine County EMS, located just south of Lexington in, uh, in Kentucky. Um, my background is I've been a paramedic since uh, about 2011, um, and I'm I'm kind of surprised that I find myself talking about um, quality improvement in data because um, I my primary focus has been the majority of my career just providing good care of patients and providing good quality training on clinical topics. So it's kind of interesting that I'm now here talking about this, but I guess it's kind of what my role has evolved into. Um, but anyway, I'm grateful to be here, and it looks like we have a very good uh, a cadre of people in the chat from uh, various places in the United States. Um, and can you all hear me okay? Good. Yes, okay. All right, good. So we'll move forward. Um, I'm actually not, I don't exactly remember how I got picked to talk on this. I think someone made a mistake. Um, yeah. But here we are, and I appreciate you all for letting me reschedule uh, because I got pretty sick when I was supposed to give the last talk. And if you think that, uh, that I'm not very entertaining now, then uh, you definitely wouldn't want to hear me when we were supposed to do this initially. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit over, the, I guess, about the next 45 minutes or so about how we look at data and <clears throat> how we do quality improvement. And I'm going to share some of our current quality improvement initiatives and some of our future ones. Um, so if you're not if you don't have much background in EMS um, and you have any questions about anything, just unmute, stop me, uh, and I'll, I'll try to answer any questions that you have. Uh, so first of all, this is my disclaimer. I'm not an expert. I'm not a statistician. I'm someone who um, kind of got, I guess, thrown into this role, if you will, um, and I had to figure things out. So if you're a data expert, um, you're going to probably be a little judgmental because I use simple equations when looking at data and uh, I have to keep things simple. Um, I will say, though, that most a lot of what I'm talking about comes off of, you know, the backs of giants um, because it's not super original. Um, I look at what I look at and do what I do because I'm willing to learn from others um, and I'm willing to make mistakes. Um, I heard a quote recently, something along the lines of, if you want to raise the bar and perform at an elite level, you have to be willing to fail forward. And I'm paraphrasing that because mistakes are going to happen along the way. And uh, it's our goal to identify and learn from those mistakes. Um, I've got a picture of Seattle here. Um, I recently just returned from the Resuscitation Academy um, in Seattle. I spent approximately almost nearly one week there. Uh, Jessamine County EMS is a Resuscitation Academy lighthouse. And 
what does that mean? Well, Seattle, uh, for a while at least, boasted some of the highest cardiac arrest survival rates in the nation. And they're really data driven. Um, and they found the secret sauce to saving more people from cardiac arrest. And each year they invite people to come in uh, free of charge, except for maybe travel and learn the steps that they took to improve survival rates so that you can then take that back to your uh, department or organization and implement those things. So our ultimate goal, I think, in looking at data, uh, and this seems kind of counterintuitive how this data do this, but I think our ultimate goal, at least mine when I started looking into our data was to snatch life from the jaws of death. And that's a quote from the Resuscitation Academy. Um, and I think ultimately it's because you have to measure and improve. Uh, you can improve what you don't or can't measure. There are quite a few things that I'm gonna share with you. I'm gonna share some of our local statistics and performance. Things that when I first started doing this job that I thought we were doing well. In fact, I would ask my, you know, my chief and some other people in our community, I would say, hey, how do you think we're doing with this particular item? They're like, oh, we're, we do a great job. And then when I started looking at the data, I realized we actually don't <laughs> do a particularly good job at this. And in my experience talking, um, talking with uh, EMS leadership across the nation is that um, <clears throat> Many think that they do a good job, but they don't know or they can't prove that they do a good job. So this is just to show you kind of one of the many things that we track. This is our one of our main quality improvement initiatives that we have undertaken over the past uh, since 2019 with a goal of saving more people from out of hospital cardiac arrest. Now, um, I guess in some ways you have to know how to interpret the data. So for example, if you look at our, um, you know, our Epstein and overall survival rates in 2021, it looks like we did a really bad job, but we're a relatively low volume department. We, we run about 11,000 calls for service a year. And of the patients that actually meet the inclusion criteria to be an Epstein patient, uh, I think in 2021, we had two. We had two patients that year, uh, and none of them survived. So obviously, our survival rates are going to be low. Conversely, if you're working with a small N, a small number of patients, uh, and let's say we had two and both survived, well, we'd be 100% for that year. So it's probably best if you have low volume to look at a five-year rolling average, which I recently come to learn that, you know, instead of trying to improve year over year, maybe <clears throat> maybe with this, with low volume, we need to do it over five years and see how that looks. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This is something that's probably, we, we have a higher volume up because um, this is our telephone CPR trends. Um, and if you're not clinical, I'll give you a brief background. Um, your chance of surviving a cardiac arrest goes down by 10% for each minute that goes by without CPR. Now, from our perspective, we thought when we were trying to save more people from cardiac arrest, we thought, you know, and I'm just throwing random numbers out, we thought we could train a thousand people who might witness a cardiac arrest. We could train a thousand people in CPR to save one person. Or we could train one dispatcher who's going to be answering the call when someone's in cardiac arrest to save 100 people. So we focused our efforts on training and improving the quality of our telephone CPR. Uh, and you'll see that there has been gradual and consistent improvement over the years. And now we do a pretty good job. Um, so we do 100% call review. We actually listen to the audio of every uh, every case that's identified as a cardiac arrest by EMS. 
and we provide that feedback to the dispatchers and we put that into a registry that I'll talk about here in a little bit. So I think that, first of all, uh, one of the biggest hurdles when doing all of this was culture uh, because you give a lot of feedback. And it's a lot of, uh, I guess you could say, very direct and very invasive feedback on some of the most difficult calls that you can have as a provider. Um, but we started off by saying that feedback is a gift. We, we came up with our own internal mantras and we tried to create what some would call a just culture paradigm. Um, but I, I advise our team and our crews that if I didn't care about you and I didn't care about your success and the quality of care that you provide to our community, I wouldn't give you feedback. Uh, but because I do care, I give you feedback. And we also got away from the feedback sandwich. I'm sure you've heard of that. It's say something good about what they did and then provide the criticism, then say something positive to kind of sandwich the negative. Uh, we got away from that because what happens when you start providing the feedback sandwich, people see it coming and they say, oh, they're only saying something good to prepare me for the hammer to drop. Um, but if you provide the feedback and the criticism first, um, and then you say, hey, I'm still proud of you, it's I'm still proud of you despite what happened. Um, so anyway, it, this takes some getting used to if you're not used to providing constant and consistent feedback because our crews get a lot of it. And on day one of orientation, I tried to prepare people for this type of feedback. Um, but I also, and I think as a, a leader and administrator, you also have to open yourself up to feedback as well. You have to be radically transparent in what you do. And for example, we hold bi-monthly quality assurance meetings where we all get together, we look at our data, we'll review actual clinical charts, we'll redact them, and then we'll let everyone that's in the meeting pick it apart and critique it. Um, and I still get on an ambulance from time to time because I like taking care of people. And uh, sometimes I'll pull my charts and I'll let the crews pick it apart. And uh, because it's not uncommon for me to do something wrong as well. So I guess at first you have to decide what you want to measure, what outcomes are you going to measure, what's meaningful for you or for your department, for your community. But um, there are a lot of measures that are already developed, uh, NIMS, NIMSQA, uh, I guess is how you would pronounce it in EMS Q National EMS Quality Alliance. Um, they already have a lot of different measures, um, and we we actually don't monitor a hundred percent of what they recommend because we just don't feel like it's it provides any um, meaningful um, patient centered outcomes. Um, and, and, you know, we don't do this in a bubble. We do it in consultation with our medical director to decide exactly what we want to measure and track. Um, there's gamut metrics. Um, and that is like a ground and air medical quality type of uh, alliance. Um, we do, we give paralytics to innovate patients. Um, so we use a lot of the metrics that they come up with because they've been long established as the standard. Um, so we track a lot of what they say we should. Um, and I am i don't get into too much depth when it comes to tracking our performance. I use simple numerator denominator uh, type of criteria. Um, just to give you an example, so for, okay, so we know that patients who have chest pain, if you give them aspirin, um, that provides 
one of the greatest benefits to the patient. Uh, we save more people in EMS by just giving them aspirin if they have chest pain than we do with almost any other intervention that we provide. Something as simple as administering aspirin that you can buy over the counter. So the, the, I guess we have to decide how you're, who's going to be included in that data set. So for our patient care report, we use the primary impression. Um, so if, if a patient has a primary impression of chest pain, discomfort, uh, primary or secondary impression, um, then that is our denominator. And then we look at what percent of patients, what number of patients in that denominator were treated with aspirin. And then that's our numerator and we simply divide it. Um, and that's about the extent of my uh, uh, analytical competence, I guess you could say. Um, Mission Lifeline also provides a lot of very helpful uh, performance metrics. And so they do recognize EMS services. They also recognize hospitals uh, for their performance. Um, and they have these different uh, uh, metrics that you have to track or key performance indicators that you have to track and you have to report. Uh, you report it annually, but you report it in quarters. Um, so we also track all the things that they do, uh, that they recommend, um, because we like getting the awards. It looks good on our website and it looks good on, uh, on Facebook. Uh, and, and it's honestly stuff that we would likely track anyway. So I did a lot of talking. I'm going to sort of walk you through, uh, put some of this stuff together to make sense. Um, let me just share this. So we started tracking a lot of stuff. And <clears throat> um, we started tracking all of these elements, uh, all of these key performance indicators. But I didn't, I hadn't really collated things. It was just we had a bunch of data and we had a bunch of numbers. So I made a simple spreadsheet of exactly what we're gonna track and how we're gonna track it uh, by means of numerator, denominator, and what our benchmarks might be. Uh, so you see we have airway stuff, we have cardiac arrest, uh, chest pain, ACS, stroke operations, or um, RSI, and then uh, we have pediatric metrics. Okay, and then um, let me show you what it might look like when I put all this together. And typically, so we're looking at data throughout the year, but I'll typically try to go back for each, at the end of each quarter and put our stats together. And this should pull this up to show you what our stats kind of look like. Um, so basically I've got these separate tabs here uh, airway performance, cardiac arrest, ACS stroke. Um, and then I simply, um, honestly, I'll select the data and then I'll insert a chart um, to kind of get a good visual of where we stand. Um, yeah, there's our P stuff. Um, visual of where we stand and something that I've just started doing was um, I made a SharePoint page as like a landing page for this. And all of these charts are kind of mapped or linked to that SharePoint page. Um, I just shared our stats. I'm going to share you, I'm going to show you something else. Um, when you start a lot of times you're going to start looking at data, I think, and it, this was my experience, and I didn't really know what to look at. Um, but when you start looking at this stuff, you kick over a lot of stones and you find the aims that you didn't know were problems that you need to improve upon. So this is what we started doing. This is um, a dashboard that is automatically generated 
bait from our patient care record. So we use ImageStream to document um, all of our patient care charts and they have a dashboard. I, I typically use like a three month, um, uh, three month time frame, and it will automatically update for me. So every now and then I like to go in and just see if anything stands out. Um, I'm gonna to try to find something that I wanted to show you. Okay, so <clears throat> this was our uh, our performance on performing a stroke assessment. It looks like we either didn't have any stroke patients early on, or we just weren't performing a stroke assessment. And uh, I believe it was last year, our state got some funds to look at uh, in-hospital and pre-hospital stroke care. And someone referred them to me and said, hey, go talk to Jessman County because they looked at, they used the biospatial database, which um, some of you might have access to, to look and determine how, how well EMS was performing when it comes to stroke assessments, scene times, obtaining a blood glucose on strokes, all of those things. And they said, EMS is not performing very well. And then they reached out to me and they said, hey, we were told to talk to you because everyone says that you track a lot of stuff and you know what's going on in your department. But when we looked at biospatial, it looks like you all aren't performing a stroke assessment. I said, well, that's weird because when I look at my internal data, we're doing a really good job. Like we almost always perform a stroke assessment. And what I realized was that the specific data element that we were using to document a stroke assessment isn't the, the NEMSIS code um, that they were pulling to determine if a stroke assessment had been performed. So that's why here you don't see anything and then you start seeing stuff because we slowly rolled this out to our crews before we made it mandatory to document these things. Um, so I guess knowing what other people look at in terms of data, because, you know, if you're a healthcare entity, there's probably a lot of people looking at your data. Uh, you just might not know about it. Um, knowing the specific elements that they look at, look at uh, might determine if you look like you're doing a good job or not. Um, we submit our data to different databases. Uh, I guess you could call Mission Lifeline a database, but we also submit to CARES, which is a, a cardiac arrest registry for enhancing survival. It's a national database. And for each cardiac arrest case, there's a lot of data elements that you have to put in. Now, we manually put in every single data element. Um, there are integrations that you can get so that this automatically go gets pulled from your patient care record, but our volume isn't enough so that they'll give us the integration. So I guess they want us to do more work. Um, so we have to review each uh, patient care record, and we also review uh, the dispatch audio and our computer aided dispatch call times. Um, and we'll go through all of that and pull whatever data we need to, to put in this registry. And they give you these very nice um, survival reports that you can review. Um, there are many states that have statewide CARES uh, database. Um, Kentucky is a care state, meaning that the state pays for it. However, that doesn't mean that every EMS service submits data to it. So just because it's available doesn't mean that people are, are doing it. Um, this is, <clears throat> so there was recently some legislation called the Carroll Act. Um, I believe it was Congressman Andy Barr's wife. Um, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but she had a sudden cardiac arrest. So they actually created legislation to provide some funding to improve upon cares and stuff like that. So um, 
you know, you could probably go online and determine if you're a care state or not. It's a, it's a very useful resource. Um, where do we get the data from? So we get our data from a lot of different things, mostly our patient care record. Um, a lot of the patient care records have their own analytical software or processes built in that make it easy to filter um, your inclusion criteria and what you want to see. Um, I do a lot of things the hard way, I think, where I, I like to build my own reports and know what's going into them. Um, we also do a detailed post-event review for every cardiac arrest. So we essentially, we transmit our monitor data and we look at each individual compression and all of our pauses and stuff like that. And I think I might have an example of that. So that's an example of what we look at here. Um, <clears throat> so after every cardiac arrest, we do a performance review. And I'm always looking at this and tweaking it. And, and now you have to be careful, I think, how you give feedback to your people. And you have to make sure that the data is meaningful and accurate. So let me give you an example. Um, you see that the, the, the depth here, the target manual depth, 20% of the compressions were in that target depth. Does that mean that the CPR was bad? No, because if you look here, the depth was actually deeper than it needed to be, which is not as bad as not being deep enough when you're performing CPR. Um, but there's something else that stands out to me here. You can see, if you can see my mouse, hopefully you can. There, let's use a laser pointer. Um, you see our compression right here. The compressions were within range, but not perfectly consistent. And if you've never done CPR, that can be hard. Uh, we do use a metronome, it automatically comes on. But then you see the right here is perfect. So what happened here? Well, we switched to a mechanical CPR device. So when I look here, when the CPR is the deepest, well, it's when we use the mechanical CPR device. So the feedback that I give to my crews, I, I use, I, this is an exclusion and I mark it as an exclusion because I don't think it's fair to judge them for what a, what a machine's doing, if it's doing its job. Um, so that's kind of what that looks like. And it gives a lot of other very important uh, data elements like the CPR fraction, pre and post shock falls intervals and longest pause durations. Um, we do create a report card for them in addition to this with what our own internal goals are and how well they performed. And we don't sugarcoat anything. Um, the data is what the data is generally until it's not. But um, if, you, if you met the metric and you were within range, you get a green. And if you didn't, you get a red. Um, I'm actually considering switching that to yellow because reds kind of might be a little too much. Um, but as I was saying earlier, when you start reviewing this stuff, you find more things. You keep kicking over more stones and more stones and you look at like how well you're actually doing. So something else that I'm about to add onto this is the time from when we place the pads on the patient to when we actually deliver a shock. Um, ideally, we want to do that as soon as possible. Um, and I just reviewed a case where, you know, it took us um, nearly six minutes to deliver that shock. Um, so that's likely going to be another one of our performance metrics or one of our goals. Um, so when you're coming up with new initiatives, uh, you should probably do a PDSA, um, which I, if I'm being honest, haven't been that good about doing. Um, when I first started doing all of this stuff, it was like throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. And, um, you know, they say that you need a period of diastole. You need to rest every now and then and recuperate. I'm generally always in systole. I'm always going, um, which can be a bad thing. 
um, because it drives myself crazy and everyone else that's around me. Um, so what I've learned was that this PDSA is very important, uh, and I have just very recently uh, started using that for uh, performance improvement initiatives. Um, so this is one of our newest initiatives, um, and I am right now just in the planning phase of this, uh, my PDSA. So there are a lot of um, EMS and patient safety initiatives out there that uh, NIMSCA, NIMSQA actually rec recommends you look at. And one of those is what percentage of time you respond with lights and sirens and what percentage of time you transport with lights and sirens. So when I started looking, it, well, five years ago in 2019, we made it an initiative to lower our lights and sirens during transport. So after we've evaluated the patient and when we're on the way to the hospital, when we first started looking at this, we transported about 50% of patients with lights and sirens, which is really high. Um, and most of the recommendations is that less than, I think, 10% of your patients should be transported with lights and sirens. It might be closer to five. So we went from 50% down to, we're hovering right around 5% now. So that's a very dramatic improvement um, since 2019. Now we want to look at what percentage of time we're responding to the incident with lights and sirens, right? Because all the evidence, all the data shows that you save seconds um, and not many patients really need those few seconds. Um, uh, in, in the majority of the time, we're not getting there to perform these immediate life-saving interventions that are gonna really uh, make a big difference. Um, so what I wanted to do was identify based on how the dispatcher, after they receive the call, how they, uh, how they, what, what call type they use, what they're putting this call in as um, to determine um, of all of those calls, what percentage of the time did we actually do something, we perform an intervention that was time sensitive, that if we had not gotten there uh, when we did that, and not performed that procedure when we did, that the patient's outcome would be different. So anyway, I made this to look at um, <clears throat> how many calls total we had based on that call type or dispatch complaint. And I looked at how many total life-saving interventions were performed. And by looking at this, I'm able to basically identify what patients we should or should not respond uh, respond with lots and signs to. Um, and I think that we should keep things simple because it's easy to be overwhelmed by all of this. And uh, I'm a I'm kind of a hypocrite uh, because I say that you want incremental improvement. Focus on one thing, evaluate it. Um, but I think that focusing on, so this is, uh, what the HA recommends the metric speed or the standard speed for, uh, telecommunicator CPR. And when I look at this, I get a little overwhelmed thinking I need to track all of this. Well, what, what, what I do is I try to pick out the low hanging fruit, like what makes the most difference. And when I was looking at this data, and this is actually a report that CARES, if you submit to the CARES registry, will give you your EMS times, not from the when they get the call to when they dispatch it. And I wanted to know how many times or what percentage of the time they're actually dispatching a call in under 60 seconds. And it turns out not very often. They've done better over the past few years of identifying the cardiac arrest and providing those CPR instructions over the phone, but they're just not getting the call out soon enough. And, you know, I'm not, when I say they're not, I mean, I think that there's probably a system issue um, and that is causing a barrier to this happening. So this is hot off the press, just identified it last week. Uh, 
So I haven't really had time to dig into it, do a PDSA on it or anything, but the plan is to sit down with the dispatchers because uh, I'm not a dispatcher. This That's their world. So I have to understand um, how they do what they do. Um, I, and honestly, when I was looking at this, I talked to some folks in Seattle and said, how do we do this faster? Like, I know you say we need to do it faster, but what are the practical, what is a practical way to do so? And they gave me some good tips on that. Oh, well, that went a little faster than I thought, uh, but it's 1236. So um, I'll pause for any questions. Anybody have questions for Floyd? I did see one in the chat, but also you all feel free to unmute your mics and ask if you would like. Uh, Lindsay in North Dakota is wondering kind of what, what motivated you and your agency to care about data? Oh, yeah, I think that's interesting. It, so the call volume depends on your perspective, right? I was recently in Idaho giving a presentation for the Resuscitation Academy. I was teaching high performance CPR. And I said, we're a relatively low volume service. And I said, our call volume is about 11,000 a year. And they all started laughing, right? This was rural uh, Idaho. Uh, so I thought that that was kind of funny. I actually still have a sticker that they gave me from the conference. Um, what made us care about this? So what the reason that I got hired was because our chief, um, he was in my role and then he moved up and he said, you know, we're not really, we haven't focused on cardiac arrest survival rates and I don't even really know what our cardiac arrest survival rates are. And uh, he said, I need to hire someone to take my job who can figure this out and fix it. And I had very limited knowledge about all of this. So when I got hired, um, I had learned about the Resuscitation Academy and they actually sent me to Seattle um, to learn more about it. Um, and then um, I came back and um, they gave me a wide berth to do a lot of different things. So then I just started tracking all of these different stuff. And then um, we had been for uh, before my time submitting data to Mission Lifeline to get that recognition, but that was basically the extent of their quality, quality assurance and quality improvement was we want to get the rec recognition from, uh, from Mission Lifeline. Um, you know, I mean, if you start tearing into this stuff, you're going to, um, I think you might be surprised what you find. I, I definitely am. Um, but a lot of it, honestly, I think is in how people document. So you, you may have seen, I had it somewhere. I created documentation standards um, so that we're getting accurate data because if someone puts chest pain discomfort as a primary impression, but the patient's chest hurts when you push on it, when they breathe, maybe they were punched in the chest, um, you're not gonna give that person aspirin, right? but the patient is having chest pain. So if they put chest pain slash discomfort, that's gonna get included in our data set when it shouldn't. So I teach my people, hey, if it's not cardiac related and you're not gonna treat it as acute coronary syndrome, then use chest pain discomfort, other non-cardiac or something like that. Hopefully that answered your question. Floyd, this is Talia. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so glad we were able to find another time. I'm wondering if you have any experience that you can share around working with any, um, you know, smaller hospitals, rural hospitals, or cause or PPS or whatever it might be, and um, any interactions that you maybe have like with their quality people, or or don't. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, uh, that's a great question. I should have included that. Um, <clears throat> so a few things. Uh, we have a great relationship with um, all of our receiving facilities. It was almost a forced relationship because I'm very persistent. Um, but 
but they they all give me access to their epic so if i need any outcome data on patients i just type in their website log in and uh, get whatever data i need um i'm also on two of the uh, resuscitation and chest pain committees. Um, so I go to those whenever they have them. Um, and when they have site visits for accreditation, um, they have me come in and provide the EOS perspective. Um, we only have a standalone ER in our community. Um, but, and then our, um, like our level one and all of our PCI centers, they're about 20 to 30 minutes away. Um, but yeah, we have a we have a really good relationship with them. Um, I will say though, like there is an integration with our patient care record and theirs um, through a healthcare data exchange. Uh, ESO has it, Image Trend has it. I imagine a lot of a lot of places have it. The interesting thing is Image Trend on their continuum, which uh, which is this thing that you see here. Um, they have just came out with an outcomes like module, I guess, where you can compare like our impression. So say if we thought the patient was having a stroke, you can compare that to actually the hospital diagnosis and see like how well we are in our assessments and maybe our treatments compared to what the hospital's impression of that patient was. The problem is, though, that um, the hospital is the gatekeeper <clears throat> for how much information gets shipped back. So we only basically get whether the patient was discharged or not, and we get some billing information. Sometimes we get a diagnosis depending on the hospital. So right now I'm actually working with uh, at least one of the big ones to identify who is the gatekeeper because this was implemented years ago and nobody exactly knows who's in charge of that. Um, and then it's the next step is to try and to get them to convince, to give the, uh, give us more data back. Um, although I can go into um, their epic and look at the patient's outcome I kind of already have a lot on my plate and don't want to manually input all of that. So I'd rather for the system to work well as designed. Did that answer your question? Yeah, no, I thought that was, that was really helpful. So I guess I have one. I'm wondering if you have taken part in um, initiatives or opportunities from the state office of rural health or from your state flex program i think scott helley was the one that recommended you to us i'm just wondering if that's something you've taken part of taken participated with in the past um well so our kentucky office of rural health has a leadership academy mm -hmm. uh, each year i went through that that was really good um, and then we do partner with them to put on a Kentucky Resuscitation Academy um, every year. So at, at one point they had funding for it and Scott reached out to me because he had known that I was an alumni from the RA. So was my chief and medical director and said, hey, I want to start putting on a Kentucky Resuscitation Academy. I said, great, I'm doing all the things that they say we should do and follow their steps. Let's do it. So we just started putting uh, putting on an annual Kentucky Resuscitation Academy. And I guess the only, I guess, caveat was, hey, we need to try to hold this in rural areas, um, which has been helpful because a lot of the states do it so that um, they, they only have it in one location. But we actually bounce around each year to try to target different areas. And when I was in Seattle last week, they were like, you know, that's a model that we're thinking maybe more people should start doing. So that's that's kind of cool. Yeah, great. Just to add on to kind of Nicole's question about um, working with um, FRHP or, you know, with your state office of rural health, the CARES initiative that you talked about, 
Did you work with Scott on that? Because that was part of, you may or may not have, but that was actually part of one of their last EMS projects was to try to help increase the use of CARES. Yeah, <clears throat> um, the, the only, I guess, um, capacity that I work with Scott on that is, is just uh, increasing awareness when we, uh, when we have our RA. I wasn't involved in like really getting it going or anything. We were we were submitting data to CARES before we got statewide CARES. So we were kind of just grandfathered in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just wondered. And actually, we lost our CARES coordinator. So uh, the CARES office has someone filling in. If you know anyone who would be interested in filling that spot. Anything else? Yeah. Any parting Parting thoughts or questions from anybody? Nicole, I hope this was what you wanted me to present on. Yeah, I thought it was great. I was, I know Tali and I were both super impressed when we talked to you before we decided to invite you for sure. And one of the things I was really most interested in was culture. And that's kind of what Lindsay was getting at too. But um, yeah, go ahead, Caroline. Caroline's going to launch the the polling post polling questions to see how um how our audience gained any knowledge from this discussion so um but i was most interested in that that culture how not only did you get your organization to care but just the culture of it how you talk to people um what you said about i wouldn't give you feedback if i didn't care and that sort of thing so um i would imagine that's something you have to really foster and really keep that going and remind people so that attitudes stay good about that and they stay open and receptive to that. So yes, the data is important. I love to see that you're doing it and focusing on it and and not only that, but collecting what's meaningful to you and using what's meaningful to you, not just collecting everything that is also great, but just that culture, how you keep everybody motivated and, and feeling good about it. So yeah, I thought this was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, I would say on the culture aspect, the feedback has to be non-punitive. You know, if it's nothing criminal or neglectful, there aren't, there's, we, we don't have punitive recourse for human errors in our department. And um, it's kind of funny because our people are, they're very transparent now. We have a patient safety event report. So if there's even a near miss where patient harm could have occurred, then they submit a patient safety event report. Um, and then over the, um, you know, over the past few years, we really expanded that. And then I, I was like, I was really surprised because we were having a decent amount of medication administration errors. So we implemented different stuff like medication administration cross check. And then I'm reaching out to these other departments and I'm, th I'm asking them, I'm saying, do you have a lot of medication administration errors? They're like, they say, no, we don't have any. I'm like, you have none? I said, no, we like have hardly any. I'm like, you do, but nobody's telling you about it because if they tell you about it, they're just going to get in trouble uh, and threatened and uh, all of those things. So yeah, um, I think it starts with culture. That's how you start it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. Okay, if nobody has any further questions for Floyd, we can thank him very much. Thank you very much. This was fantastic. and and go ahead and let you go. We're going to just let our group kind of talk amongst themselves about the projects that they're working on and um, just give them some time to chat. So thank you so much. We really appreciate you doing this for us. Yeah, thank you all for having me. And uh, share my email with anyone who has any questions. Sure, I will do that. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. All right, you guys. So that was the end. That's the end of that. We have nothing else scheduled for the last 10 minutes. We just like to give you guys some time to talk to yourself, talk to each other, not talk to yourselves. That'd be odd <laughs> to talk amongst yourselves and ask any questions that you have or talk about your projects, what's going really well, what isn't, whatever you guys want to talk about. That's what this time is for. So um, I'm going to be quiet and let you guys do that.